and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a second round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. Like what you hear? Click the thumbs up. Don't care for it? Click the thumbs down. Good luck to all of our contestants. Trail by Soren Narnia, performed by Brendan Barlow for the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights Evil Idol competition. My name is Sean Loxley. I'm 23 years old and in my last year of study at the University of Wisconsin. In mid-October of 2005, I noticed a small flyer inside of a cafe advertising a Halloween carnival in Rose Creek Park, three miles or so outside the Milwaukee city limits. My friends and I were looking for something to do on Halloween, so we decided to go to the carnival for some cheap thrills. There were three of us that night. Me and my friend Darcy Carew and Jack Lear. We were all pre-med students at the university. We had a few beers at my apartment on campus, and then we set out for the carnival. But... We wound up not getting there until almost 10 o'clock. Some of the lights had been turned off in the park, and there weren't that many people milling around anymore. There was a haunted house for small kids, another one for more mature kids, and a haunted trail leading off into the woods. The trail was what made me want to come to the carnival, because I knew Rose Creek Park went so far and so deep into the woods that it was guaranteed to be creepy. Even though all it would certainly be was a bunch of fake tombstones and lurching zombies and vampires that leapt on cue but from behind trees. But it looked like we were too late for the haunted house and the trail. We bought some cider and no new Hatrex came along to take us down it. And no one else had gotten into line. It was about 10.15 when one of the employees of the carnival told us it was pretty much over already. Which meant Halloween itself was done. We were disappointed but not too terribly so. We started discussing where we should go to drink. The spooky sound effects CD that had been playing over the, some loudspeakers stopped, and it seemed like everyone had just about gone. It was very dark in the park by then. The lights had been dimmed all over. Just as we were about to leave for good, a horse-drawn carriage came clanking up to us from across the field in front of the woods. The carriage was driven by a tall man in a top hat. He stopped his horse and stepped down from his seat, removing his hat. The man had long, stringy hair that had thinned in several places, and he seemed about 60 years old. He smiled at us, and we saw that his face had been heavily rouged. He wore a top coat with a white shirt underneath it, and garish bright blue pants. On his feet were old white sneakers. Nothing about the man matched. He greeted us expansively and offered us a ride down the trail, the very last of the night. We were initially tempted, but only one of us by that time wasn't thinking about heading off to the bar. Jack was still excited about the trail. He was 21 years old. He wanted to go on the trip, preferably alone, so he could get the maximum scare. I remember him saying that. We just laughed at him as he climbed into the back of the rickety carriage. Without asking for payment, the coachman tipped his hat at us, donned it, and got back up behind the white horse. He got the horse moving with a gentle nudge, and the carriage slowly turned around toward the north and moved across the field. Jack leaned out and waved at us. He said he would meet us at the Four Provinces Bar in about 45 minutes. The carriage bumped along across the field and entered the trail that led into the woods. Then we went on our way. An hour and a half later, we were firmly ensconced at the Four Provinces, and we'd begun to worry a little. When two hours passed, we left the bar and walked back to the park. By now, the area where the carnival was being staged was virtually deserted, except for a few straggling workers. The next morning, the haunted house and the other attractions would be removed. Darcy and I stood at the place where we'd last seen our friend and saw nothing that hinted at his whereabouts. Our cell phones had no messages. We waited there for a full half hour before we returned to the bar. No sign of Jack. We went back to the park. It was now a little past two in the morning. Everybody was gone. The area was lightless. Darcy and I walked across the open field in front of the woods and stood at the head of the haunted trail. We could see fake tombstones marching off into the darkness, and we decided to walk the trail. The atmosphere as we went was more than unsettling. Rose Creek Park is not the most dangerous after dark location in Milwaukee, but there's been plenty of crime there in the past. We walked the full half mile of the haunted trail, past artificial spider webs strung up in the trees, and a row of hanged dummies dangling from ropes, which were just silhouettes in the moonlight now. We called for Jack, but no answer came. When we came out on the other end of the trail at a residential street called Hortus Avenue, we went right to the police, but 
We never saw Jack again. The police conducted a thorough search for him, covering every inch of the trail and most of Rose Creek Park. No evidence of his presence or of a mysterious coachman was found. More mysterious still was the fact that the operators of the Halloween carnival claimed that they'd never hired any coachman with a carriage to take anyone down the ghostly trail. They operated three open hay trucks, and that was it. The coachman had been an interloper, but no one else could remember having seen him or his horse or his carriage, and no track marks suggesting a carriage ride were found along the trail. Two months after Jack's disappearance, Darcy called me at home because something else was greatly disturbing her. Her memories of the night we lost our friend had been undergoing a slow, strange metamorphosis. Little by little, she had been losing her recollections of the mysterious coachman. In her mind, she could only see Jack insisting that he could catch the last hay truck of the night if he ran down the trail. He was saying he wanted to make a run for it, because he had seen the truck get onto the trail just as the employee from the fair told us we'd missed it. Darcy now had vivid memories of Jack running across the field, a little drunkenly, intent on getting on that hay truck. I was bewildered by this. I knew our encounter with the coachman had been real, and I thought Darcy must now be overwhelmed with grief and shock to the extent that her mind was playing tricks on her. But she swore she had all but lost her images of the coachman entirely. The picture of Jack running across the field alone was quite strong. She couldn't even really recall what story she had told the police. I figured it didn't matter anyway, because nothing would change the fact that the search for Jack was essentially over. Something terrible had happened to him. That was all that mattered. But the more I mulled over Darcy's story, the more depressed I became. On December 28th, I walked back to Rose Creek Park, to the site of the long-vanished Halloween carnival. It was a little after 9pm. I looked at the field where I'd last seen Jack and began to walk. Inside of two minutes, I was at the head of what had once been the ghostly trail, but was now just a pedestrian walking path leading into the woods. It had snowed two days before, and there were three inches of powder on the ground. The light refracted off the snow and gave me plenty of light to walk by. I didn't feel very safe, but I didn't much care about that anymore. As I walked, I could very clearly recall the fake tombstones and artificial spider webs I'd seen two months before. I seemed to remember the exact location of each. Ten minutes into my moonlight hike, I turned my head to the right, remembering that this was where Darcy and I had seen a row of four stuffed dummies hanging by their necks from trees. I stopped, stunned, when I saw that the dummies were still there. Fifteen feet or so off the trail, silhouetted eerily. They had never been taken down. A chill went through my spine. It was only twenty degrees outside, but I felt much colder than that. I stood staring at the effigies, unable to go on. It struck me that there was no snow on the fake corpse's shoulders. There should have been if they'd been hanging there for longer than two days. And even drenched in shadow, they seemed much more realistic than they had before. I took a few steps off the trail to get a closer look. There was no question that these corpses were different somehow. They were not merely husks stuffed with hay and paper. They looked very much like actual dead bodies. I was about to step even closer when I heard the clomping of a horse's hooves on the path behind me. I turned and saw a carriage moving my way. At that point, my mind and body locked up almost entirely to the point where a scream was impossible, running more impossible still. I could see little bits of snow kicked up when the horse trotted forward, and when the wind rose, its mane blew partially over its eyes. The coachman sitting above him was nothing but a dark shape. The carriage came up to me and stopped. The horse turned its head toward me and then quickly looked away, disinterested. The coachman climbed down slowly from his perch. It was the man who'd taken our friend away on Halloween. He was dressed the exact same way, down to the top hat and tattered sneakers, his face heavily rouged. He turned to me and removed his top hat and invited me to go down the trail in style in the back of the coach. There would be no charge, the man said. I managed to speak then, just a few words. I asked the coachman where my friend Jack had gone. The coachman said he would be only too happy to show me. It was just up ahead. He half bowed and stepped back, opening the door of the coach. But I would not get in. Of course. I was not going anywhere with that madman. Seeing my reluctance, the coachman put his hat back on his head and continued to smile kindly. He told me that if I did not wish to come voluntarily, he would make it easier to oblige. The next memory I had was sitting in the back of that coach as the horse pulled it down the trail. There was no recollection of getting inside the coach. I was simply there, frozen with fear. I recalled every detail of the trip that then began. The snow on the ground, the moon hidden by clouds above them, the way my breath plumed in front of my face, the sound patterns of the horse's hooves on the path... I saw that the mock tombstones were back, and now there were far more bodies hanging from the trees, some of them hanging from heights that seemed impossible. 
Once or twice as we went, I had to crane my neck upwards to see a body hanging from a branch almost a hundred feet in the air, so high up I could see no detail. Each body I saw was different. None showed any signs of carnival fakery. Some of them seemed to be children. And the tombstones themselves became more and more realistic as we went, doubling in number and then tripling, until it seemed like we were not even traveling through Rose Creek Park anymore, but rather a large wooded cemetery. The tombstones varied in size, and soon large, silent tombs appeared in the woods. I tried to read the names on the stones and tombs, but it was too dark to make out more than a few. The thought of leaping from the carriage did not even occur to me. My mind was in an absolute fog of terror, in the same state as someone in a dream in which voluntary action is impossible. The worst moment for me, before the coach stopped, came when I saw the glare of distant car headlights through the trees, confirming that I really was still in Rose Creek Park, and reality was only a quarter mile away, but unreachable. The horse eventually stopped in its tracks, and the carriage creaked as the driver stepped down. He opened the door and motioned in his sickly, gallant way for me to step out. I did. We were in a large field that I did not remember from my first walk down the trail on Halloween night. This one stretched as far as the eye could see. The city wasn't there on the horizon as it should have been. The coachman told me to take my time and get a good look. He was in no hurry, and this journey was meant only to please his customer. What I beheld in the field was a sprawling, unthinkably massive pile of human bodies, an accumulation of corpses suggesting some sort of secret genocide. The pile rose twenty feet off the ground in some places, there must have been thousands of dead bodies there, and very few of them were still intact. I could see, even through the dark, that there had been an effort to at least partially dismember virtually all of them. They'd been hacked at, cut up. I saw stray arms and legs in the bloody snow. Just a few yards from where I stood, I saw what looked like a collection of fingers lying on the ground, grouped together with a rubber band. An empty soda bottle lay nearby. The coachman spoke to me. He said that the city around us was a violent place, one that killed and killed and killed. He couldn't keep up with it all. He had to chop up the bodies into bits to make room. But every night there were two or three more. The people in the city never stopped killing. Even as he said these words, his smile remained never wavering, as if he were incapable of any other expression than a vacant grin. The coachman told me that my friend Jack had wandered off into the woods, where a junkie had stabbed him many times and tried to hide him. He said the police would find him nearby if they really looked. The coachman lifted his right arm and pointed off to the east, then asked if he could put the body on the pile with the rest. I tried not to look at the man. I squeezed my eyes shut, determined never to open them again. I heard the coachman's last few words. Good night, friend. Use caution in these parts, and <laughs> happy Halloween. There was a the sound of the coachman getting up onto the carriage again. The horse began to move. I heard it clomping away and the carriage rattling. The sound slowly began to fade as it made its way back down the trail. In a minute or so, it was almost gone. I opened my eyes. I saw the carriage as a tiny dot moving deeper into the woods. When I turned around, there was no field in front of me. I was just at the end of one of many walking trails in Rose Creek Park, the one I remembered from October 31st. I soon emerged from it and found myself just outside the city again. I sat down on the curb and wept. Eventually, I found a cab to take me home. The police found the body of Jack Lear on their own, but not until 2006, roughly where my carriage ride with the coachman had ended. Jack's body was entirely decomposed by then. Foul play was obvious. There were twelve stab wounds in his chest. There have been no more Halloween carnivals inside Rose Creek Park. My memories of that night, the night I last saw Jack, continue to this day. They play out with an unexpected invitation from a coachman to take one last ride down the trail. Darcy only remembers our lost friend making a dash for a hay truck that could never be reached. Thanks for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. By doing so, you'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team. At the close of voting on August 15th, based on your votes, the top 25 contestants will advance to the third round, which begins September 1st based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you 
to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Night.